today. Welcome to the historic King County Courthouse entering its 101st year. And thank you for joining us today for this special program to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the arrest and imprisonment of Gordon Hirabayashi here in the King County Jail. We are uh, joined by a number of community leaders today. My name is Rod Dombowski. I serve here on the King County Council representing North King County, including the birthplace of Gordon Hirabayashi, which was Pontiac, Washington, which most of you probably know now as Sandpoint or Magnuson Park, uh, where a community of Japanese steak farmers settled in the early part of the 20th century and where Gordon's family farmed and where he was born, uh, just down the road from the University of Washington, which he would later attend. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Uncle Frank. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to play a little bit of an MC role today. We have some very distinguished guests uh, joining us, including uh, hopefully my colleague Larry Gossett, who himself spent time on this floor incarcerated, uh, <laughs> fighting for civil rights back in the day. Uh, Rod Kawakami, a representative of the legal team that later uh, reversed the conviction of Gordon Hirabayashi. Rod. Yeah, Rod's here. A very special guest who's traveled a long way, Gordon's son, Jay Hirabayashi from Canada has come down. And with Densho, Tom Ikeda is here. Where's Tom? There he is, right there. I think I saw my colleague, there she is, Council Member Claudia Balducci, who represents Bellevue. And Be yes. <laughs> Bellevue, of course, has its own long history with the Japanese American community. Uh, for, and, and the Strawberry Days Festival, I think, which goes on to this day, really is rooted in uh, the heritage of the Japanese American community and their farming culture, uh, which also existed in Bellevue. Um, let's see, I don't wanna, or, there's so many uh, powerful leaders here today, I won't go to go down the list uh, because I'll forget somebody. You know, um, in preparing to commemorate the 75th anniversary of Executive Order 9066, I was bumping around the internet doing some research and stumbled upon uh, the UW Archives collections, which um, to this day holds the Gordon Hirabayashi papers. And in those papers uh, were a collection of diaries, diaries that uh, Mr. Hirabayashi kept in this jail just feet from where you are today. And this says on it, King County Jail, June 1942. Um, and they noted the cell block uh, and the tank in which he was uh, jailed. It was uh, 75 years ago today that Gordon was experiencing uh, some of his last hours of freedom. And take yourselves back to what he must have been thinking. He knew what he was going to do. President Roosevelt had issued Executive Order 9066 and the United States government had posted the signs on the poles around this community that folks would have to leave. They would have to turn in all of their belongings uh, and would be uh, really forcibly removed to a place that they didn't know, to communities that they didn't understand, to harsh environments, and lose and leave everything uh, that they had here. And that struck Mr. Hirabayashi in the deepest way. Uh, he was a member of the Friends, uh, a pacifist uh, religious uh, organization, right? The Quakers, some may call them. Uh, and his philosophy of nonviolence and of peace and peaceful protest motivated him to take a stand, a courageous stand uh, that few in history take. And it took a long time for history to correct the wrongs. But that stand uh, led him uh, 75 years ago today to spend his final hours of freedom. And uh, tomorrow is the 75th anniversary of when he got in the car with his attorney and drove downtown Seattle to FBI headquarters to turn himself in and insist on being arrested and detained rather than turn himself over to the United States government and be forcibly removed uh, to one of the internment camps in the interior west. It was a courageous uh, move. It's something that we are going to commemorate here today uh, so that future generations, folks that go through that door to face justice in the courtroom or folks that go through this door to legislate uh, and pass laws will remember uh, and keep in mind. Um, so uh, those are my opening remarks. I'm gonna turn it over now to Rod Kawakami, who um, was on the legal team, and I know he's joined by some, some others of his team here who I'll let him introduce to share a few words. Please welcome Rod. Thank you, 
Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of Gordon Bayashi's Coram Novus legal team, we want to thank Council Member Dombrowski for inviting me to speak at the ceremony here today. And as I begin to think of the symbolic meaning of this dedication here, uh, my first thoughts was that I've heard of naming hospital wings and rooms and buildings and sometimes even buildings, but I can't say that I've heard of too many dedications of jail cell units. <laughs> and then as I thought more seriously about it, I thought that it couldn't be more appropriate to serve as a reminder of Gordon's courageous showdown with the government over his historic <laughs> yeah, that was me. <clears throat> Over his historic constitutional challenge to the government's racially biased incarceration of over 120,000 citizens and residents of Japanese ancestry. Since his uh, sacrifice included not just the stigma of a conviction, but the actual loss of freedom in, a, in his quest in, in, as a guest in one of our county's finest accommodations here on this court, in, in this building. I want to share a quote from Gordon on how he looked at facing jail time, and it comes from a lecture he gave in 1985 entitled, Good Times, Bad Times, Idealism is Realism. And he said, as a novice violator, one might wonder where I got the strength or how I overcame fear. Living in a desperate situation is part of the answer. Someone once told me that strength comes when there is nothing left to fear, and freedom is available when there is nothing left to lose. I was in such a circumstance. Whether I obeyed or not, I would either be behind barbed wires of a concentration camp or the bars of prison. Why not liberate myself by standing for those values which give me incentive to live? Something told me that if I valued my American citizenship, I must live with my head up like an American citizen. And this jail is also significant to Gordon as the one thing that hurt him the most as a consequence of his initial court challenge was the fact that during his trial, his parents were called by the government to testify as government witnesses. Uh, they were taken from the internment camp in Tule Lake, and despite efforts by his legal committee to house them here in the community, the government rejected those offers and held them instead in jail for 10 days during the legal proceedings. In relating this experience to the judge, in one of our Coram Nobis hearings in 1984, Gordon explained to the judge, quote, I relate this incident for two reasons. First, the government was totally unconcerned about my constitutional rights. The government wanted to win at all costs to justify its treatment of Americans of Japanese ancestry. Secondly, the gross callousness in which they treated my parents after bringing them to Seattle depressed and shocked me to the core. The confining of my parents in jail is a scar that I will carry to this day." End quote. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with his Coram Nobis case, I want to just tell you a little bit about what that case was about. Uh, Gordon was originally convicted in 1942 on two counts of violating, violating military orders that were authorized under President Roosevelt's Executive Order 9066. And one count was for violating uh, the curfew order, which required that citizens be in their homes by 8 o'clock at night. And the other was for violating the exclusion order, which in turn the over 120,000 Japanese Americans and permanent residents. The Supreme Court then upheld these convictions in 1943 based on the government's later to be proven false representation that these orders were based on, quote, military necessity, end quote. 
Then in 1982, almost 40 years after his conviction, based on recently, then recently unclassified documents, we proved in court that in order to preserve these convictions, the government concealed, covered up, and misled the Supreme Court, altering and destroying evidence that the basis was not military necessity, but was rather based on a purely racist rationale. The Ninth Circuit, in 1987 vindicated Gordon when it ruled that the government did indeed perpetrate a fraud on the court and it vacated both of Gordon's lower court convictions. Now my participation in Gordon as Gordon's attorney began in 1981 which is some maybe 36 years ago when I was a then a young energetic and somewhat naive attorney. Now of course I am somewhat less energetic but a wiser old attorney. <laughs> and it is sad, not just that I'm old, but that the reason that attracted me to the case in the first place so many years ago, still, as we sit here in this room today, still is in need of confrontation. Even with the victory in Gordon's case and the passage of the redress legislation in 1988, we are experiencing modern day versions is the same thing. I conclude my remarks today by again quoting some of Gordon's prophetic warnings in open court during a 1984 hearing in our case when he addressed the court by saying, quote, this is not my case. This is not only a Japanese American case. This is an American case. Since the answer to the question, can it happen again, is yes, it is vitally important during relative periods of calm to ensure that bizarre solutions have less opportunity to occur. And as we know today, there are bizarre solutions that are being proposed with the Muslim ban. And I do want to say that I'm very proud that Washington State was the first to challenge the constitutionality of that ban. Yeah. And, and I see Diane's in the room, and even this morning, there was organized a protest and a vigil regarding the court cases that are going on even today. So it's very important that we continue to be vigilant, continue our efforts, even more so today than maybe back then. So I want to thank you again. Thank you. Right, Rod. And uh, Rod, let's see, if you just raise your hand if you were on the legal team with Rod. I know some of you were here some time ago. There we go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You want it? Rod, go ahead and introduce, introduce him. <laughs> That's Jeffrey Beaver. Mm -hmm. You want to stand and wave yeah, to everybody? There you, go, there you go. And actually, Diane Narasaki was part of the team. She helped us out a lot. I don't think Benson Wong made it today. He was here last night. Oh, OK. Time. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And um, we're joined by Clarence Morawaki, who came over from the Bainbridge Island Japanese American uh, Memorial. Clarence, thank you for being here. Executive Constantine. Uh, has sent his uh, lead transportation guy, Harold Taniguchi, very involved in the community. <laughs> Happy to have Harold here. And uh, I see Frank Abe, who's done a lot of research on the no-no boys. Gordon might be the original. Hell no, no one boy. <laughs> Thank you for being here, uh, Frank. Uh, please give a warm welcome to uh, the conscience of the King County Council, my hero on the King County Council, Council Member Larry Gossett. I'd like to begin by thanking my colleague on the King County Council, Rod Dombowski, uh, for having the insight to see the importance of Gordon's case as we began to celebrate the 75th anniversary 
of the unjust incarceration of our Japanese American uh, citizenry here uh, in the United States, but particularly along the west coast of, the, of this country. Uh, I'd like to start by saying uh, Gordon uh, was a political prisoner, and I thought it was very apt that his lawyer talked about the essential choice that he had going as a Japanese-American to a concentration camp or going uh, as a conscientious objector to the treatment of his people to jail. Um, very harsh choices, but the one that he selected showed the extreme courage uh, that he had uh, at a historic period when there were very, very, very few uh, people uh, that were willing to stand up, American citizens in particular, they were willing to stand up uh, beside him and take uh, similar stands against the injustice of the mass incarceration of Japanese uh, people. But Gordon wasn't the first uh, conscientious objector or a political prisoner here in Seattle. Uh, the first ones were the American Indians who uh, uh, fed, sheltered, and taught the first European uh, settlers into uh, this region starting between 1852 and 1854, and then settling down and calling a city Seattle because they couldn't uh, enunciate South. And uh, they started this city in 1861, but just seven years after they began uh, as a city, uh, these Europeans saw that they wanted to pass one of their first uh, ordinances, uh, and it said that everybody that was perceptively uh, Native American or original peoples of this land shall have to leave town by 6 p.m. each evening or they would be arrested. And they were, uh, that law was passed, and the first 13 Native Americans that were arrested here in Seattle were all arrested for violating uh, extremely unjust law. Uh, finally, I would like to just say that I had the um, opportunity years and years uh, later, like Gordon, to be housed here on this floor <laughs> in the King County Jail. This was the jail beginning 1929 and remained the jail where all of you are standing until 1986 when we built the new one a couple blocks uh, west of here on Fifth Avenue. Uh, but when I came here, we saw ourselves as political prisoners because we went to jail at, in the Franklin sit-in and on April 4th, 1968, the same day they killed Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, because we had uh, protested the expulsion of two African-American uh, women students, black women students at Franklin High School who had worn their hair, their beautiful hair, natural. And the principal said, y'all no longer look ladylike. So he expelled them and sent a note home with each of them telling their mothers, your daughter can no longer come to Franklin High School until she begins to look uh, ladylike again. Uh, and we were put in jail, and, and uh, Charles Carroll, the prosecutor, said, oh, Lord, I, we never had these kind of people in Seattle before. <laughs> they must have come from outside. I was born at King County Hospital. Y'all call it Harborview now. <laughs> <laughs> he called us outside agitators. But he said they came up here and disturbed and upset for no reason at all our Negroes. Just that sentence tells you that this cat wasn't thinking right. But nevertheless, he recommended we got uh, six months in the county jail. That is why I think it's important from time to time that we had that we have press conferences and remembrances 
like this so that we don't allow the citizenry of this great city that Donald Trump now is calling the Soviet of Seattle. I don't know where he got that from. Uh, but we have to stand up for one another across race, class, age, gender uh, lines. And if we continue to do that and take the inspiration from uh, people like Gordon, uh, we can't help but in the end uh, be victorious at celebrating uh, freedom and humanity and fair play. Thank you very much again, Rod, for inviting me. Our next speaker today uh, probably knows the story of his father better than anybody, and that's uh, Jay Hirabashi, who's come down from Canada to join the special celebration. Please give a warm welcome to Jay Hirabashi. Uh, yes, on behalf of uh, the Hirabayashi family, my uh, dad's wife, Susan Carnahan, and my sisters, uh, Sharon Ewan and Marion Oldenburg, <clears throat> I'm really uh, honored to be here uh, speaking on behalf of uh, my father. Um, growing up, uh, <clears throat> my dad never uh, presented himself as a hero or as a uh, anybody other than just his role as uh, our dad. And uh, it, <clears throat> although he told us that he had been in jail and uh, told us the circumstances when we were kids, we didn't really, uh, it didn't really sink in. <clears throat> and it wasn't really until I was uh, 19 and I was working in a resort town in Colorado, <clears throat> uh, and uh, one of the other employees there was uh, a law student from uh, Denton, Texas. And he asked me if I was related to Gordon Hirabayashi, and I was kind of surprised that <clears throat> somebody would know my father's name. And I said, yes, it, you know, it was my dad. And uh, he, s he told me that, uh, that my father's court, court case, Supreme Court case, was studied in his law history classes, and that it was one of the uh, few times that the Supreme Court had made a mistake. And uh, I uh, <clears throat> began to realize that I didn't really know much about my dad. <laughs> um, so um, in thinking about this 24-year-old uh, man <clears throat> uh, and the decisions that he made, um, I'm, I'm still kind of awestruck. Um, and I'd like to just, uh, you know, he spent, uh, <coughs> he didn't have much time to do much else but write uh, when he was in jail. So um, I'd just like to read something that he wrote um, about democracy. Um, this is uh, dated June 4th, 1942. He quotes President Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, quote, we are fighting as our fathers have tonight to uphold the doctrine that all men are created equal in the sight of God, unquote. And then on July 4th, 1942, King County Jail, he wrote, 166 years ago today, a band of earnest and far-seeking individuals drafted and signed a document, the Declaration of Independence, because of their vision and conviction, we, the people of these United States, have made tremendous advancements in the liberation of mankind from political, social, economic, and religious slavery. There are yet many bridges to cross, many highways to build and to travel. We have only begun our quest toward the realization of the free expressions of man and life. Even in our progress, we have had our ups and downs. We often lapse, even openly, into economic totalitarianism. We have had political, economic, and social discrimination against the Negroes since their beginnings here. In spite of constitutional guarantees, greed, selfishness, and insecurity lead us to fall short in the practice. Today, in our remembrance of the Day of Independence, there is a dark shadow signifying our shortcomings. 
Through hysteria and the spread of war psychosis, 113,000 people of, quote, Japanese ancestry, both alien and non-alien, unquote, are confined behind barbed wire and armed guards as prisoners of war. Notice how they are classified, both alien and non-alien. A total and deliberate evasion of the recognition that over 60% of those confined are native-born American citizens of respectable standing. Dissent has taken priority over citizenship. American citizens are being held prisoners by their own government. They are told that to be prisoners is the patriotic thing to do. What shattering of their democratic vision, what a jolt to their social and psychological status as citizens. Tragedy of tragedies, their only crime is that of dissent. But even though this is America, these things happening today are not American. They are the results of misinterpretations, misemphasis concerning the right thing to do, hysteria and short-sightedness. It is up to us, to those of us who feel that a wrong has been committed, that we have fallen short, to bear witness to that fact. It is our obligation to show forth our light in times of darkness, nay, our privilege. The risk is great, the consequences unpleasant, but there is the vision of those seekers of independence. We must carry the torch, we must live our lives. Fascism must be extinguished here. Right. Just a rambling thought in rem remembrance of the fourth, incarceration of liberty. Yeah, so as, um, as Rod has mentioned, uh, <clears throat> it's really um, almost deja vu uh, today in, in the United States. Um, in Canada, we kind of look in horror <laughs> at what's going on down here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so this day is really significant for our family uh, to have my dad's uh, Sojourn here, <laughs> recognized as as um, a significant uh, stand for the rights of all Americans, and uh, I thank you for inviting me to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay. Our uh, final speaker today, before we. Uh, unveil the plaque which is behind you uh, is Tom Ikeda with Den Show. Tom, thanks for being here. Come on up. It's always uh, tricky to be the last uh, speaker because uh, you're never sure what other people are going to say. Um, but what I thought I would do is, is share a personal experience I had um, two weeks ago that I think you know, pulls a lot of this together. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, you know, a former resident of King County, actually. Uh, she's now the president of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. And she asked me to come down to Birmingham to speak about the fear and racism that happened on the West Coast that led to the you know, mass removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans. And uh, right before I spoke, I was able to uh, tour this just fabulous facility. Uh, it's a world-class museum. You know, I, I, I kind of know this. I'm on the uh, Board of Four Culture. I've been on the Heritage uh, Advisory Committee for about eight years. And so I've, I've seen a lot of museums. And it was a, a fabulous telling of the uh, Civil Rights Movement. And as I was going through this, I, I, I turned the corner. And it was a, sort of a dark corridor. And, and there they had the jail cell that held Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, when he was um, imprisoned there for um, you know, his civil disobedience against segregation in the South. And uh, I, was, I was lucky in, in some ways because when I turned the corner, um, it was quiet. It wasn't crowded. And uh, you know, I, I took some time just to think. And uh, you know, one, it was a, a powerful moment for me you know, to think about the struggles and the, uh, you know, the challenges and, and the deaths, uh, including Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, and his stand for um, injustice. And in fact, you know, I, as I stood there, 
I remembered uh, the quote from, you know, the letter from Birmingham jail where he said, um, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And, uh, and as, I, as I sat there uh, thinking, you know, one, I was, you know, I actually thought back to our county and how privileged and honored it is to be in a county, to live and work in a county that is named after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, I think, you know, that one, I, I think it always centers us in terms of our, our social justice. Um, the other thing that I, I thought, and I, I, as I was just literally sitting there, I, I did think about Gordon, because in a very similar way, you know, he was here in a jail cell 75 years ago, um, you know, in, in his sort of nonviolent civil disobedience against what was happening to, to Japanese Americans. About 17 years ago, I had the, uh, you know, the uh, honor of doing an in-depth oral history with Gordon. And so for about 12 hours, you know, I would just sit uh, across from him and hear his life story. And you know, one of the most dramatic stories was the telling of his time in this facility. Um, you know, I, I was going to read this, the same letter that uh, you know, Jay uh, talked about. So instead of that, I'm going to tell a story that he told me that it was the one time where I saw Gordon uh, cry during this interview. And in the same way, it was, it was about his, his, uh, his parents, in particular his mother. Because when, when Gordon decided to stand up um, to, the, to the government and take a principled stand, and his stand was always that ancestry is not a crime. And he was willing to pay the price. And when he, but when he told his mother, his, his mother pleaded with Gordon, says, please don't do this. Because if you do this, Gordon, it would split the family up. And we're not sure what's going to happen. That you know, they're going to send us down to Tule Lake. And, and if you don't come with us, I, I may never see you again. And, and Gordon told me how his mother literally cried and pleaded with him. That she said, you know, I, I, I understand what you're, you're trying to do, but please don't do this. And, and I know that when, when Gordon was telling me this story, it, it really weighed on him, as he, especially as he sat in the uh, jail cell. He, he talked about how, in some cases, how down he was. But then one day, he got a letter from his mother. And uh, as he told me this, uh, you, you could see the tears well up. Because what his mother told him, um, it was another little story. Uh, the, uh, his mother said, you know, when they got to Tule Lake and they were settling in, uh, they had a, a knock at the door. And, uh, and there were two elderly women there who had walked miles uh, from another part of Tule Lake. Uh, it was a very large camp. And they were all dusty and tired. And she said, and she didn't know who they were. And she said, so why are you here? And they first said, this is, are, are you the mother of Gordon Hirabayashi? And she said, yes. And they said, we just came to thank you because, because your son is, is making a stand for all of us. And, and when Gordon read these words from his mother, he knew his mother then understood what he was doing and, and in some ways approved for what he was doing. And as Gordon told me this, you could see he, he talked about this weight being lifted off his shoulders while he sat in this jail cell in this, in this facility. You know, there was, um, and something that, that Gordon wrote while he was in jail, and, 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 and um, Jay read it, there's, there's one sentence I want to highlight, because I think it, it does highlight what we need to think about uh, today. You know, Gordon, um, you know, in that, um, on that July 4th, on Independence Day in 1942, when he wrote, um, he said in one sentence, he said, it is our obligation to show forth our light in times of darkness nay, our privilege. And when I think about what's happening in our country today, I mean, if, if you're being targeted now, if you're part of a community like the Muslim community or undocumented immigrants, or if you're part of a group that has been targeted in the past, you know this is a, a time of darkness for us, that um, uh, you know, things that we had hoped uh, would, would never happen again are happening again. Um, and so. But as I look around this room, though, I, I, I do see light. Because I, I, I believe Seattle and King County is a place where people are standing up. Uh, they are supporting Muslims. 
and undocumented immigrants in ways that aren't happening in other parts of the country. And so I know if Gordon were here, uh, he, would, he would sort of you know, wave the flag of, you know, we have to you know, pay attention to, to this. But he would also be very encouraging, because he was, he was that kind of man. And, and so with that, you know, again, thank you, King County Council, for acknowledging Gordon and his life, because that's the light that we need, especially during these times. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tom, for those remarks and for sharing your time. Uh, a couple more recognitions. We're joined by Senator Bob Hasegawa from the 11th District is, is here. And Jay Watanabe from the Japan America Society has joined us here, right here. Where's Jay? I'm sorry, Dale, Dale. Sorry, that's when you try and wing it. And uh, we are gonna do a reception uh, afterwards over here uh, in our council office, and we've got um, staff, Ann Jenner from the University of Washington Archives is here and has brought materials. Wave, wave your hand, Ann. And we're gonna ask her to say a few words about her studyship of these, of these materials at the reception. Uh, I want to thank For Culture, uh, for the, which is our cultural development authority, for their help uh, in putting this uh, uh, plaque together. And again, to the Hirabayashi family for helping us design the plaque and uh, selecting the quote. Finally, and she'll make sure I don't screw anything else up, <laughs> my chief of staff. Uh, who has really been instrumental in putting this uh, together, Christina Logsdon, a com great community leader. <laughs> Step up, <out>, Christina. <laughs> yeah. you know, let's, we're just gonna have her say a few words, yeah, and fix, and fix any mistakes I've made. <laughs> Um, thank you for all for being here. As a Japanese American who grew up in West Virginia and who didn't much have much of a community, um, when I moved to Seattle, it felt like coming home. And um, I, you know, this is, you're my family. So thank you for being here. It means a lot to me. And for what Gordon has done in the history of our community and, and fighting injustice, um, we, we all are needed now, so thank you so much. Um, one more thank you that to give is to uh, King County's Historic Preservation Program, who also, with Col For Culture, helped with the design of the plaque. So also wanted to thank them for being here. Thank you. All right, so what we're going to do, the plaque is directly behind you. We're gonna take a, a little one minute pause and reposition. We're gonna flip around and uh, let's see. I think Jay and I will go over and uh, we will uh, unveil this special plaque. And uh, thank you all for being here.